Today's webinar is by IMED Pharma, and at this time I'd like to introduce Anne-Marie Quinville, who is their Director of Sales in North America. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Wow, what a fantastic turnout. That's impressive. We're honored to sponsor this webinar with the OAO and Dr. Badia. My name's Anne-Marie Quinville, Director of Sales, North America for IMED Pharma. Most of you know us as a Canadian-owned, family-owned company with over 30 years of being at the forefront of managing dry eye. We invest heavily in R&D so that we can bring forth to you and your patients the most innovative and effective products out there, including our Eyedrop MGD and our EI IRPL, which is new. Our speaker today is Dr. Amit Badia. Dr. Badia earned his undergraduate degree in the Bachelor of Health Science with distinction at McMaster University. He then went on to earn his optometry degree at the University of Waterloo where he had the opportunity to help train family medicine residents in basic ocular examination techniques. He completed his external disease externship at Tallahassee Clinic in Florida, gaining extensive experience in managing and treating diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and ARMD. He's been working at Dr. Dorio and Associates Eye Care since 2017 and performs primary care and dry eye exams. Welcome, Dr. Badia. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, just we'll get started right over here. Uh, as I was introduced, uh, most of you may not know me. My name is Dr. Amit Bhatia, and I help run the dry eye clinic alongside Dr. Stephen Dorio at Dr. Dorio and Associates Eye Care in Toronto. So the purpose of this presentation today is we're gonna have a look at a literature and evidence-based uh, critique at how dry eye disease and refractive surgeries interact and impact the final outcome. Now, as you may be aware, dry eye disease is very extensive uh, nowadays, and there's a lot of information, and even just in terms of this presentation, we're only gonna be focusing on certain aspects just for the sake of time. So we're gonna have a quick overview of a current understanding of dry eye, and then we're gonna move on to the main meat of the presentation. So we're gonna consider uh, the effect of surgery on the ocular surface and how best we can manage patients before and after surgery. And what the theme of this presentation will be is more than meets the eye. So we're gonna try having a look at factors that may not be as readily apparent and as optometrists, you may not have considered as much, but which can still have a significant impact in patient care. So before we get started, let's just do a quick little poll so we can pull up the polling question. Are you guys familiar with the 2017 uh, DUSE2 study conducted by the Tear Film and Ocular Society? Okay, we're just gonna wait for the Bills to come in, I believe. Okay, so that's actually really good. Ninety per ninety one percent of you said yes that you are familiar with this study. That's an excellent. Okay, we can close out of the poll and then we'll return to the presentation. Uh, so I'm guessing most of you are aware, this was a study that was uh, started in 2015. It involved a lot of healthcare professionals and what the purpose of uh, this used to study was, was to get a better understanding and a better definition of dry eye that was more comprehensive and took in the new advances that had been made in the research fields of dry eye. So this is the official definition of dry eye that DUSE2 came with, and they define dry eye as a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface that's characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. Now, this is quite a huge definition, uh, and you can spend an entire presentation just on this definition alone, 
But the main idea you have to take away from this is that they uh, recognize dry eye as a complex and significant functional disorder that cannot be characterized by a single process sign or symptom. One of the more important uh, things they mention is the homeostasis of the tear film, which homeostasis describes the state of dynamic equilibrium in the body with respect to its various functions, such as chemical composition of fluids and tissues. And the disruption of this homeostasis is a unifying characteristic that leads to dry eye disease. And one of the major things they mention is hyperosmolarity, which is defined by the number of solutes in the tear film or how salty the tear film is. So this is just a very simplified look at how dry eye uh, proceeds or what a vicious cycle of dry eye is created. So on the left over here, you have the healthy ocular surface. As you're aware, uh, our tear film, uh, there's a mucin and an aqueous layer which exist in a continuum. It's not a separate layer. And then you have a lipid layer on top, which prevents uh, the aqueous layer from evaporating too quickly. And this is needed for a healthy tear film homeostasis. Now, there are many different causes that lead to dry eye, uh, such as MGD, or you may have a poor functioning lacrimal unit, you may have corneal damage, and all of these things can lead to a disruption of the tear film homeostasis. In this example, there's a break, uh, lipid layer is very poor, so you get increased evaporation, decreased tear volume, leading to hyperosmolarity of the tear film, and this leads to a vicious dry eye cycle. So you get irritation, which releases cytokines, which damage the cell membranes, which causes more tear deficiency. And this just continues on uh, more and more. And one of the major things due to uh, recognize is since dry eye is such a complicated disease, it requires a little bit more objective uh, instruments, especially the newer ones that are on the market. So this is just a quick overview of how we do dry eye testing in our clinic. So we start off with a patient symptomatic questionnaire. There are many different questionnaires on the market. Uh, Speed, DUQ5, and OSDI are the ones that are used more routinely, uh, especially Speed and DUQ5, which are shorter and good for screening the patients. And then you can measure osmolarity. Currently, there are two different instruments on the market. You can use iPen from iMed Pharma or the Tear Lab. And MMP9, which is a, a matrix metallopeptide 9, which is a cytokine produced when your epithelial cells are experiencing inflammation, is recognized by a newer instrument called Inflamadry. And you can also take tear measurements with phenol red thread test and Shermer test, mybography with topographers, which have the capability using uh, iron light, and then obviously using your own slit lamp examination. So this is a quick overview of how one would manage dry eye patients in their clinic. And this brings us to potentially what the DUCE2 recommended, how you diagnose dry eye properly in patients, is you start off with asking triaging questions through your questionnaire, and then you do your diagnostic test, and you diagnose and define dry eye disease if they score high on the questionnaire, and they score at least one abnormal homeostasis marker, such as abnormal non-invasive tear breakup time, abnormal osmolarity, or positive surface staining. And then you define dry eye such as evaporative or aqueous. We, I'm hoping uh, when the OA opens up after COVID, we can do a more thorough examination of this process, but for now on, we're gonna move on and focus on surgeries. So before we get started on that, let's just do a quick little poll again. Do any of you utilize any point of care testing instruments in your practice? So A, do you have the ability to only check osmolarity, for example, with iPen or with Tear Lab? Do you only have the ability to check mybography? Do you have the ability to check uh, osmolarity, mybography, and MMP9? Or do you have none of these instruments and you, you mostly use slit lamp examination when treating or diagnosing dry eye patients? Okay, so we have the results coming in. 
So it's interesting, 66%, so majority of you only assess with sit lab examination, which is very understandable. Most of these instruments are very new and otherwise only about 10% have the ability to check all three. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you very much. We can exit out of the poll. All right, so now we're actually gonna move on to the main idea of this presentation and the effect, uh, looking at the effect of cataract and refractive surgeries on the ocular surface. And once again, we're gonna be focusing on the concept of more than meets the eye. So what's hidden behind what we may actually just be able to see. So the primary thing to, to understand about any kind of surgery and its effect on the ocular surface is that all surgeries pretty much damage the ocular surface. And the primary cause of this damage is through inflammation. And new dry eye disease following either phaco emulsification cataract or LASIK is very common after due to the inflammatory uh, cascade that prom gets promoted. Risk factors can include, for example, damage to your corneal nerves, use of preserved eye drops during surgery and after surgery, forced eyelid opening, which prevents normal blinking and gland secretion, and long microscopic light exposure, which causes thermal damage. And just for example, this is a quick look at how LASIK can have impact on the ocular surface and essentially it leads to a cascade of different damaging effects. So in general terms, LASIK leads to a disruption of the intracorneal nerves and also damage goblet cells, which are secrete mucins into our tear film. This leads to decreased corneal sensitivity and altered mucin, mucin expression causing tear film instability. The decreased sensitivity also causes decreased blink rate and meibomian gland secretion to go down. And this also increases tear evaporation. All of this can lead to tear film hyperosmolarity, thus leading to more dry eye symptoms. This applies to PRK and phaco emulsification surgeries as well. So let's have an overall look. Uh, looking through what's currently available in literature, uh, what they have noted at Ocular surgeries cause significant damage to a variety of different dry eye signs and symptoms, such as affecting tear breakup time, OSDI score, causing meibomian gland expression to decrease. The important thing to note as optometrists is that the majority of the literature supports the finding that all of these detrimental effects peak at about one week to one month, and then they slowly show gradual improvement till three months to sometimes six months onwards. So your patient will feel the worst at roughly about one month period. So for example, this is a general outlook of how tear breakup time is affected. And uh, you can see it initially decreases over uh, here from first day, one week, even up to till one month, slowly showing gradual improvement till uh, three month post-op, and then it stabilizes after that. And in terms of corneal staining as well, initially it does increase. In this graph, it's showing patients who have previously had been diagnosed with dry eye and patients who had not been diagnosed with dry eye. So um, right over here, the lighter bar graph represents patients with dry eye and darker bar graph represents patients who did not have dry eye after, before they went for surgery. And both of them do worsen up one day to one month, but re start returning to their pre-op levels at about two to three months. Okay. And one of the things, once again, we have to really consider with any kind of surgeries is their uh, damage they induce to corneal nerves during surgery. For example, when creating incisions during phaco emulsification and LASIK, and then the actual stromal ablation that occurs during LASIK and PRK. And what studies have noted that surgery induces significant decline in corneal sensitivity and the actual nerve density. And the corneal sensitivity effect is shown on the graph right over here. This is the patient who underwent phaco emulsification. So they can uh, check their corneal sensitivity at different areas in their cornea at pre-op. And this patient had a, what is normal, they had a temporal corneal incision during phaco emulsification. As you can see, one week that corneal sensation shows a statistically significant de decline. And even at one month, the corneal sensitivity had not uh, returned to its pre-op levels. However, by three months, it has recovered to what the corneal sensation was noted to be preoperatively, which is the normal course of action. However, one thing to note is that the actual nerve density and innervation do not fully recover even after one year, some studies have shown. This is important to note because uh, this may explain why some patients have persistent dry eye disease after surgery and they don't recover because their corneal nerves may show aberrant regeneration. 
And this was a study that was done in 2009, a comparative study by Kim et al, which evaluated the effect of corneal sensitivity and recovery of corneal innervation after cataract surgery. And as seen on the graph right over here, <clears throat> the nerve density uh, significantly decreases post-op and even by three months, even it had been shown to show a gradual trend towards recovery, it still hadn't recovered to its pre-op levels. This study only went up to three months, but other studies going up to a year show that this effect, uh, this decline stays persistent. And for people such as myself who like a little bit more pictographic representation, this is that patient who underwent surgery. So pre-op, you can see the corneal nerves. They're nice and organized. They're thick. They're easily, easy to visualize. And then at one week post-op, shown in here in B, you can see it's disorganized and the corneal nerves are very faint. Even by the one month mark, there's not really much improvement. By the three month mark, as shown in picture D, you can see that some of the organization has started to return, although the corneal nerves are not as dense as they used to be. And one more thing we're gonna look at more than meets the eye is goblet cells. Now, goblet cells are things that even when I started, I didn't really consider because you can't really see them when you're on your slit lamp exam. So goblet cells are stratified cells that are found on the conjunctival epithelium, and they're heavily concentrated on the nasal aspect of the eye. They secrete a variety of mucins, uh, which form a major component of the inner mucus layer of the tear film. In addition, they also help to regulate inflammatory responses on the ocular surface. So damage to these uh, corneal nerves, such as shown previously, can actually have an effect on goblet cell secretion because decreased reflex from those nerves will lead to decreased secretion from these goblet cells. That's why healthy goblet cell anatomy and function is essential to forming a good tear film and reducing dry eye symptoms. But if you don't have a good tear film, you're gonna have, uh, uh, you're not gonna have the mucin layer to keep the tear film together. So, Looking at the importance of these goblet cells, this was a prospective randomized trial consisting of 48 eyes conducted in 2012, which looked at the effect of cataract surgery on goblet cells. And they suspect that cataract surgery damages goblet cells through repeated irrigation of the surface and through microscopic light exposure. And what the study noted, as shown on the graph on the right over here, there was a decrease in goblet cell density that was statistically significant at one day and even stayed statistically significant till three months, even though it had sh shown slight improvement, even by the three month mark, it had not recovered to its pre-op levels. Unfortunately, this study did not follow patients for more than three months. Uh, so we don't know if by six month mark, they had shown uh, pre-op level of goblet cell density. And once again, looking at actual pictograph, this is a little bit more visual representation of what the cataract surgery does. So on the left over here, this is known as an impression cytology slide, which stains the conjunctival goblet cells so you can see them uh, visually. So in this series, if you look at part A, this is a patient before they underwent cataract surgery. The goblet cells are stained in this dark purple, and you can see they're clustered together and they're numerous. And the lighter uh, purple circles you see are normal conjunctival epithelial cells, and they also show good organization and they're coalesced together. Right after surgery in picture B, this is one day post-op, you can see uh, goblet cells are pretty much gone over there and there's a huge disruption in the organization of the conjunctival epithelial cells. They're really disorganized, they're not coalesced together. And even by the one month mark, as you can see in picture C, goblet cells are starting to return, as you can see them darkly stained at the bottom and the conjunctival epithelial cells are starting to come together, but they're still not at their pre-op levels. By the two month mark over here in picture D, you can see a little bit more organization coming in, but they still hadn't recovered to their preoperative levels, which may explain why patients complain of dry eye because their tear film does not have those mucins being produced at the same rate as preoperatively. One interesting thing that this study also noted was a correlation between goblet cell density loss and operation time. So essentially, the longer the operation went on during surgery, the more goblet cell density loss was shown. And they suspect this was due to longer microscopic light exposure, which causes more thermal damage and thus more inflammation. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. This is important because you may have complicated patients who are going to undergo cataracts or refractive surgery. 
And you may want to let them know the longer you are under uh, or the longer your operation goes, you may get an increased chance of dry eye happening after surgery. Now, this brings us to an interesting point then. If goblet cell loss is associated with longer surgery time, will switching to a different surgical style induce less goblet cell loss and thus less dry eye? And this brings into something called femtosecond assisted surgery. As we know, phaco emulsification is a current gold standard, but many clinics are starting to offer femtosecond assisted surgery, which involves a laser making the initial incision instead of the surgeon. And then the laser is also used to soften the lens before removal. This is supposed to be faster and it breaks down the lens easier. A study in 2015, a prospective uh, non randomized study, actually studied these effects. And what they found was the exact opposite of what one might expect. While, as shown in the graph right over here, one of the things they me measured was the fluorescein staining score. While right after surgery, both the laser groups, so femtosecond group shown in the dark uh, bar graph and the normal phaco emulsification group shown in the lighter bar graph did show uh, dry eye worsen after surgery. The people in the femtosecond group had a much more severe ocular surface staining score than the people in the phaco group. Also, the patients who had pre-existing dry eye ha actually had more severe ocular surface staining with femtosecond surgery, even though the surgery time was shorter. And now you may be thinking, why is that? You know, why does femtosecond assisted surgery actually worsen post-op dry eye? It can be a matter of incision because that's made by in both surgeries. Uh, so it can't be a matter just of corneal nerve damage. Well, it turns out what we have to consider is the unintended side effects of this newer procedure. And the answer lies in the procedure creating the initial incision. So how the actual incision in femtosecond assisted surgery is created is that it requires the use of a suction ring, similar to LASIK surgery in flap creation. And this suction ring creates a strong vacuum seal at the conjunctival corneus limbus region. And a prospective study on LASIK patients actually examined the effect of this suction ring on goblet cells. And what they found was where that suction ring was applied, there was a huge decrease in goblet cell density loss that persisted at least till one month post-op. And what they also noted was that this damage was limited to the mechanical stress of the suction ring. It was not due to other inflammatory markers. So one thing to take away from this is that femtosecond assisted surgery should not be recommended on patients who already have pre-existing dry eye disease because that can actually make it worse for them. It will cause more goblet cell density loss. So essentially, the pearls to take away of the surgical effects on ocular surface is that most uh, surgery causes inflammation, which causes dry eye disease. Most factors worsen, but usually recur recover within three to six months, but corneal nerve density does not. And you should avoid femtosecond assisted cataract surgery for patients who already have dry eye disease. Okay, before we move on, we're just gonna do a quick little poll again. And now I know, understand, in the previous question, you probably, most of you don't have these instruments, but uh, just uh, for, you know, for the people who do have these instruments, I'm curious to know, do you do this point of care testing on patients before you send them out for a referral? So A, do you only do them if they are at high risk or if they have a previous diagnosis? B, you only do it if they're complaining of dry eye symptoms. C, you do it on every referral, regardless of symptoms. Or D, you do not have access to these tests. Okay, so as expected, since most of you don't have it, you don't have access to this, only 3% do it on every referral regardless of symptoms, and most of you only do it if they're complaining of dry eye symptoms, so 15% of you. Okay, that's very good to know. That will bring us to our next slide. We can exit out of the poll. Perfect. So I wanted to ask this because what are our goals as optometrists when we send patients out for surgery? Well, obviously, we want to decrease the incidence of post-surgical dry eye disease. But we also want to promote the best refractive outcomes and improve their quality of vision. 
And what I want to stress is you should not act after they start getting these symptoms. You should act even before the patient undergoes the surgical intervention. And this, once again, brings us to more than meets the eye, stuff that may not be apparent, but you have to really consider. And I'm guessing this is a very common scenario which every one of you have encountered in your practice. Your elderly or even your younger patients come in complaining of blurry vision. I'm getting night vision driving issues. I'm getting halos at night. And it's very easy to say, well, that sounds like a cataract. It may well may be a cataract, but we also have to look beyond that and consider the importance of a proper functioning tear film. So why is the tear film so important to uh, kind of realize and observe in patients undergoing surgery? Well, that's because the tear film contributes nearly two-thirds or about 40 diopters of the total refractive power of the eye. So an unstable tear film will lead to halos, glares, and other visually significant signs, which can often be confused with cataract. This is, and it's also important to check this in all patients because all instruments which are used for pre-op measurement, such as keratometry, topography, or wavefront analysis, they rely on light projections of the tear film. They assume a stable, cre clear precorneal tear film. However, dry eye disease results in irregular and highly dynamic tear film, which can affect biometry measurements. In fact, the ocular surface is the rate limiting factor when you're taking these measurements. Let's just have a quick little uh, look at how this can occur. So this is a patient who had dry eye, and this is in, uh, they're undergoing corneal topography. And as you can see, before any treatment, this instrument reflection is incomplete. It's missing some areas. It's not able to acquire as much data, and the Myers are a little bit more disorganized. This patient underwent thermal pulsation. Don't worry too much about the actual treatment, but it improved their corneal tear film. And right after that, uh, what the uh, researchers noted, the topographer was able to acquire more reference points, and the Myers were more organized, thus providing better data. Even in terms of when you're taking refraction calculations, I found this was a very interesting case. Uh, so this is a patient who was going undergoing cataract evaluation, and this is an IOL master reading, which is used in Canada as well. And this patient had dry eye uh, that wasn't being treated. And initially, the IOL uh, master said they would need a 20 diopter lens for their cataract surgery. This uh, uh, ophthalmologist put them on one week of cyclosporine and topical steroids and artificial tears. Now, one week is not enough for cyclosporin to work, but the steroids and the artificial tears did improve the tear film quality a lot. And what they found was now the IOL master actually correctly predicted that they would need a 21 diopter lens. So without treatment, it, this patient may have actually had a hyperopic refractive surprise if the dry eye hadn't been recognized. And this kind of brings us into, well, that was a look at more anecdotal evidence. Let's actually have a look at specific studies. So there was a study, an observational prospective study conducted in 2015, which studied the effect of keratometry measurements and IOL power calculations. And specifically, they looked at how hyperosmolar tears affect keratometry readings and corneal astigmatism uh, measurements measured on two different days to see how much variability is found in dry eye patients compared to normal patients. And what they found was rather surprising. It's summarized right here in this table. And one thing to note is that everything highlighted in blue is a statistically significant difference. What they noted was that the mean difference in average keratometry reading taken between two days was only 0.13 in the normal group, but it was almost double or 0.28 in the hyperosmolar group. More importantly, what we can uh, have to consider as optometrists is that more than 10% of, uh, or 10% of the hyperosmolar group showed a difference of more than 0.5 diopters when it came to calculating their IOL power. And more than 17% of them showed a one diopter difference in corneal astigmatism measurement. This is shown on the graph right over here. In the normal group, the red uh, dots over here are more clustered together, so there's not much variability versus the hyperosmolar group where the corneal stigmatism difference is a lot more variable and 17% of them are above the one diopter difference line. And based on these figures, this uh, study postulated that approximately one in 10 patients can have incorrect IOL uh, calculation due to hyperosmolar tears. So what I want you to take away from this is that hyperosmolarity and unstable tear film can lead to variable measurements and keratometry values are a major factor when you're calculating IOL power calculation. 
In fact, a one diopter error in measured corneal power is approximately equals one diopter error in post-op refraction. So what you want to do is you want to make sure they have a stable ocular surface before you send them out for surgery. This will lead to more accurate biometric measurements, more confident refractive calculations, and better post-surgical quality of vision. So what I would recommend is if you do have access to uh, osmolarity testing, do them on every patient undergoing surgery. Which kind of also I want to talk about patient questionnaire before we get started. So let's do that poll quickly. So I just want to say which one, if you do use a questionnaire, which one do you use? Okay, so most of you don't use a dry eye questionnaire in your practice, and uh, otherwise it seems to be split, with most of you using, using DQ5 and split between speed and OSDI. Okay, that's very good to know. Thank you. You can exit out of the poll. And why I wanted to ask this question is I want to have a look at, once again, self-reporting versus objective findings. And what one of you, some of you may be thinking is, do we really have to do all this testing, especially in scenarios where the patient is really not complaining of dry eye symptoms? And even if, let's say, you're like, oh, I want to do testing, how do you convince the patient that they should get tested if they feel completely fine? Well, there have been studies done looking at how self-reporting of dry eye symptoms actually correlates with objective findings of dry eye disease. And one of these studies conducted in 2017 was a multicenter study called the FACO study. And this study measured the incidence and severity of dry eye in patients undergoing cataract surgery. And they looked at patients' subjective symptoms with questionnaires, and then they evaluated objective slit lamp findings to see what, uh, what the correlation was. And what they found was rather surprising. They noted that 50% had positive central corneal staining with a very poor mean tear breakup time of about 4.95 seconds. And more than 80% of these patients had tear breakup time of less than seven seconds. Now with this, you would expect that the patient would be extremely symptomatic as well. However, what the study noted was that approximately 60% of these patients never complained of any dry eye symptoms and only 20% actually had any previous diagnosis of dry eye disease. So there was a huge disconnect between the objective findings and what the patients actually reported. In fact, the authors note that without testing, you would have missed 15 to 20% of these patients uh, in terms of diagnosing them with dry eye. Well, this study only looked at slit lamp exams, such as tear breakup time and staining, which most of you have in your clinic. However, nowadays we have, as we said, osmolarity and MMP9. Only a few of you have it, but how does that correlate with object, uh, subjective symptoms? Does the disconnect show when comparing patient subjective symptoms and point of care testing? Well, there was a study to address this question done by Duke and Cornell University in 2018. And similarly, they looked at patient symptoms such as the OSDI score and questionnaire, and then they try to correlate with, with objective findings such as osmolarity and MMP9 expression and corneal staining. And what they found was the underdiagnosis of dry eye is actually worse when you bring these tests into question. They noted that the majority of these patients had at least uh, one of these tests abnormal. More than 80, so 85%, more than one test abnormal. Even though 57% had no diagnosis of dry eye disease, and 83% of them scored normal on their questionnaire. But even though they scored normal on their questionnaire, 85% had at least one abnormal test, and 48% had both tests abnormal. So what the study reinforced is that dry eye disease has a high prevalence, and simply relying on patient symptomology or asking them 
is not enough, and you may be missing about 80% of your patients who have dry eye disease. So in terms of the basic pearls for self-reporting and objective finding, one thing to realize is that dry eye has a high prevalence and is very underdiagnosed, especially in the cataract populations. And you should try to do as much objective testing as you can. And in terms of testing, osmolarity has the highest positive predictive value of dry eye disease compared to other tests. And studies have shown that patients are more accepting of their diagnosis and treatment of their ocular surface disease if they are made aware of it before surgery rather than after surgery. Well, that was looking at all everything that happens before surgery and importance of looking at the tear film. How about after surgery? So they do have a, they have a cataract surgery, they have their LASIK surgery, and they come back to you. And once again, this is a very common scenario you may all face. Uh, the patient comes back to you, they're almost finished using all their medicated eye drops from the ophthalmologist, but their dry eye is still persisting. Now, they, when they say they go to the pharmacy, they're overwhelmed with the number of choices available. And you say, hey, use preservative-free artificial tears. But if the patient asks, is it really worth it for me to spend that extra money? Is it actually beneficial for me? Well, it turns out it actually is. Preservative-free uh, artificial tears and preservative-free drops have been shown to be significantly better for post-op healing than preservative drops. So this was done, uh, shown in a, a randomized control trial done in 2015 where uh, patients after undergoing surgery, cataract surgery, were either put on preservative-free formulation of an artificial tear and steroid versus a preserved formulation of the same kind. The dosing and patient characteristics were all the same. And they measured a couple of different uh, dry eye factors, including subjective and objective findings. And what they showed is that there was statistically significant improvement noted in the preservative-free group when you compared them to the preserved group. One of these things they noted was a tear breakup time change. So as you can see, one month post-op, the preservative-free group shown in the white graph uh, is showing a greater tear breakup time compared to the ones that were using preserved uh, eye drops. And this effect was even more pronounced at the two-month mark. So the people using the preservative-free groups uh, had a healthier tear film and were healing a lot faster. And once again, people who are more uh, inclined to using images such as myself, this is a patient who under, in that group who underwent uh, cataract surgery. As you can see on the pictures on the left over here, initially right after surgery, both the preservative free uh, group and the preserved group showed similar damage to goblet cells right after surgery. The goblet cells were decimated after surgery as expected. However, two months uh, post-op, you can see the people who are using the preservative free drops showed a lot more goblet cell recovery. So the goblet cell uh, were a lot denser and more coalesced together versus the people who are using preserved eye drops. So the people in the preservative free eye drops would have a healthier tear film, which would help them to recover a lot faster. So yes, preservative free eye drops are going to be much better for your patients. Well, one other thing to look at is we know that dry eye disease is mostly due to inflammation. And nowadays we have steroids, which we often use to, uh, for this purpose, but we cannot use steroids for longer term relief. Nowadays, we have other drops such as cyclosporin or restasis. Given this idea, does this correlate to cyclosporin being effective in improving your post-op results? This was the purpose of this small but randomized and double blindness study that was conducted in 2010. And this study took patients who were undergoing bilateral phaco emulsification, and they treated one of those eyes, so treated one eye with cyclosporin twice a day, and the other eye with just artificial tears. And the purpose was to see whether the patient preferred one eye over the other, and whether there was a difference noted in the objective and subjective signs of dry eye at, at baseline and two months surgery, post-op uh, surgery. And what they found was that cyclosporin-treated eye showed significant improvement in the eye that was treated with artificial tears alone. It showed the improvement across various factors, one of which is the mean ocular surface staining score as shown over here. And as you can see, both the, uh, the cyclosporin group shown in the dark bar graph had a lower corneal surface staining score and a lower conjunctival staining score uh, compared to the artificial tear group. 
And another thing that the study noted was it also helped to, helped to improve the mean contrast sensitivity score as shown on the graph right over here, where the cyclospore in treated eyes had a higher contrast sensitivity than the eye that was just treated with artificial tears. This is essential to note because this can not only provide, this can provide better quality of vision for your patients post-op, especially for patients who are undergoing IOL exchange with premium or toric IOLs, whereby glare and contrast issues are more apparent. So use of cyclosporin drops would help those patients a lot more in reducing those symptoms. And this beneficial effect of cyclosporin was not isolated to objective findings alone. Subjectively, the patients reported better comfort in their eye that was treated with cyclosporin than compared to the eye treated with artificial tears alone. So the pearls to take away in terms of post-surgical care is that you want to use preservative-free formulations of drops whenever possible because they do improve uh, healing time and show consistent improvement in dry eye signs and symptoms. And cyclosporin uh, has been shown to be very effective in reducing dry eye signs and symptoms across various studies. That was just one study we looked at, but other studies have supported similar findings. So in terms of how you should approach your patient, what I would suggest is this was a kind of pre-surgical algorithm that's being proposed by the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. So this was a consensus reached by the American uh, Ophthalmological Society in how to best approach patient care. And what they recommend initially is to do keratometry and topography. Now, we as optometrists are not really going to do that. But one thing we should start to do is making sure we screen all patients for dry eye disease. And what they recommend is you use symptomatic questionnaire. They use speed two, but you can also use OSDI. And then they say, check for osmolarity and MMP9 on every patient, regardless of signs or symptoms. Because as we have seen, objective uh, measurements are going to be much better. If everything is normal, then you do your normal uh, slit lamp exam and then refer them off for surgery if they are ready. However, if you find any abnormal screenings, such as high osmolarity or high MMP9 expression, and you suspect uh, dry eye disease, you should do further testing for these patients, such as mypography, topography, looking at non-invasive tear breakup time. You can use OCT to measure the tear um, thickness quality before you do your slit lamp exam. And this way, you're not going to be missing out on patients who are not complaining but have signs of dry eye disease. So this is just a, a graded recommendations a slide we have created for you. And graded recommendations are based on actual literature review. So grade A refers to strong recommendation that's supported by high quality evidence. And grade B is also is supported by moderate quality evidence. But both of them can be applied to most patients and most cases. As we said before, preoperatively, identify pre-existing dry eye disease on all patients and treat any uh, dry eye disease aggressively before you send them out for surgery. Get the, have, try to get them have the best uh, tear film quality as you can. Preoperatively, we don't have much control over it. This is the ophthalmologist area, but you want to avoid femtosecond laser-assisted surgery in patients with high risk. And this was a graded A recommendation. And post-op, you want to make sure you evaluate your patients early because, as we noted, one month post-op, they're going to feel the worst. You want to tell them that this is normal and you will show gradual improvement. And another thing that's really great is uh, adding the use of cyclosporin on top of their normal eye drops to promote faster healing and better recovery. You want to taper off medications, especially preserved eye drops when uh, everything is settling down. And make sure you follow up with the patients to make sure they're not showing any persistent dry eye disease after three months. So this is just a quick little summary slide of everything we have discussed. And that's pretty much it. What I wanted to uh, get across is you as optometrists are best suited to use your position as a primary care provider to help your patients achieve better refractive outcomes and improve your quality of vision. Ophthalmologists are not going to have as much time to spend with their patients. So you should actually get started in terms of managing their recovery even before you send them out for surgery and make sure to take all these pearls into consideration. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, my contact information is right there. I would also like to just say thank you to IMED Pharma and to Dr. Greg Dorio, Dr. Stephen Dorio, and Dr. Noelda Fernandez for providing valuable feedback. 
And you can feel free to email me if you have any questions about running a dry eye clinic. We started new as well. Or even if you have a patient you would like to send out for a consult for dry eye, feel free to email and reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baccio. So I will now share some of the questions um, mm -hmm. you've provided. How long do you keep high-risk patients on cyclosporin? So in all of these studies, what they did was they started these patients on one month before surgery, and then they continued on two months post-surgery. Unfortunately, there's not much studies for longer-term effect, and even those studies did kind of uh, uh, say that fact. What I try to do is on every patient, I recommend you do osmolarity testing especially. And if that's high and MLP9 expression is high, start them on cyclosporin if clinically indicated. And then I would at least keep it going, at least their osmolarity is showing improvement and I can get it down to acceptable levels before sending them out for surgery. Uh, but in terms of the minimum a number of time, I would say at least one month before surgery, but I would do it longer if needed to bring their ocular surface into better shape. Great, thank you very much. Another question, how much do you charge for os osmolarity testing? So osmolarity testing, I believe in our clinic, we do it like a whole dry eye workup. And then we charge currently 195 for patients who are not, uh, don't have any OHIP coverage. And uh, osmolarity, I believe it's about 45, if I remember correctly, but we don't do it isolated mostly. We sometimes do it isolated when the patient is following up with us and we just want to check osmolarity to see if our treatment is improving or not. But for all dry eye testing, which includes osmolarity, MNP9, slit lamp exam, mybography, uh, non-invasive tear breakup time, roughly about one night. Okay, thank you. Next question. Some patients asked about hydrosense. Do you know this PFAT? I don't have much knowledge of the actual composition of hydrosense. Uh, but in terms of uh, using preservative-free formulations, I would be okay with that. Uh, as for uh, even artificial tears, there's a lot of preservative-free formulations on the market, as you're all aware. I don't have hypersense in my own clinic, but we do have other ones. I try to gear my patients towards medication which I feel would be most helpful in terms of their composition. So for example, if they have a lot of SPK, hey, maybe triolose is going to be a little bit better for you. If you have a lot of lipid layer deficiency, then the new uh, IMED drop, the MDD drop would be a little bit better. But as long as it's preservative free for hydrosense, I would say it's better than just picking up refresh off the uh, counter from the pharmacy. Thank you. Next question. Um, does the use of trimoxy dropless CE have the same effect on dry eye? I am going to be honest. I do not know what that is. Can you say it again? Trimoxy dropless CE. Dropless CE. Yeah, sure. cataract. Oh, that's a, I'm looking at it, apparently it's a newer type of cataract procedure. I'll be honest, I do not have knowledge about this procedure. I don't have any patients who underwent this, so I can't really comment on uh, if it's better or worse. Uh, most of the studies I looked at, they considered femtosecond and phaco emulsification, and in, in terms of that, phaco emulsification has less reported dry eye, but I'm not sure about the dropless cataract. It's trimoxifloxacine dropless cataract extraction. Yeah, I'm to be honest, I'm not aware yeah, okay. of that procedure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question, we've got lots of questions coming in. How do you okay. prescribe cyclosporin? Is it covered by OHIP drug benefit? Uh, no, I don't believe it's covered by uh, OHIP drug benefit. We do have uh, these kind of uh, I would say rebate cards we have from the manufacturer, which we give out to patients, and it cuts off some of the pricing of the restasis. Now, restasis is a little bit more generically available as well in some cases, so it's cut down the price a bit. I'm not sure about the difference in product between generic and restasis, but that is one of the different factors in terms of cyclosporin that even we have had in our clinic that it is costly to the patient because they usually have to get about a three month supply initially, cost about roughly about 100 bucks per month. Uh, but I don't believe it's covered by drug benefit. Okay, thank you. Another question. Any conflicts with ophthalmologists not recommending femtosecond surgery? So I have talked with one uh, uh, surgeon in terms of femtosecond surgery. He's not fully sold on it. 
he is not in terms of just a dry eye. He says phagal emulsification has just been studied a little bit better. It's the current gold standard, so that's what he's more comfortable with. I personally have not had any kind of uh, conflict with that, but it's not a decision I make for the patient. When I send patients out for surgery, I never say get this type and don't get this type. I just educate them, and even in my referral, I would put in to the ophthalmologist, just even, I have a, like if this patient has really severe dry eye, do you think femtosecond is, is the best option or fake emulsification and get their opinion? Even in all these cases, I would say work with the ophthalmologist and just let them know if you have a, uh, any kind of trepidations about certain surgery. And that's what I do for my patients. I have had patients who are going basic procedure where the laser surgeon says, hey, you're ready to go. And I have disagreed. I've said, I think you should try to get your dry eye under control a little bit better. It's just about educating, letting their patient know, but I don't make a decision for them. Great, thank you. Next question. Do you um, present globally pre-dry eye syndrome to a non-symptomatic cataract patient prior to surgery and then schedule a follow-up post-cataract? And is there a pre- and post-op fees since seniors fall into 406 or 402? Yes, so at least how we do it is yes, I recommend to all our patients they go to pre-op if they're going for a cataract or refractive procedures regardless of whether they are symptomatic or not. Um, we have a dry IP that we charge and that's for the testing. So we do a normal 406 initially to make sure everything else is good, check their cataract. And then we have our dry eye testing that we do, which they get charged privately. And that's because that's not covered by OHIP. And that includes uh, material costs for like a tear osmolarity, uh, the tips that we use, the inflammatory testing, the mybography and everything that's not covered since that's imaging. And then we send them out. When they come back for post-op, what we do is they're normally covered for 402 for their regular checkup, but then we charge them for individual tests as needed. For example, if we're just going to check osmolarity down the line, then I just uh, we just build them for osmolarity testing instead of doing the whole dry eye assessment again. Uh, so it becomes a little bit more individualized because some patients, uh, if they're improving a lot, you know, they're, uh, then I just kind of say, okay, we're going to do osmolarity testing in six months versus patients who are suffering a lot more, I'll say, okay, let's do it in three months. And then we just charge it individually for those testing as needed, rather than a post-op dry eye fee. So initially they pay a dry eye fee and then the individual basis as needed. Great, thank you. The next question, are there any tips you could recommend for beginning the conversation during a mm -hmm. pre-test when there's a high OSDI score that OAs or ocular hygienists could do to being the education process early in the appointment, opening the door for the OD's conversation? Absolutely, so that's actually really good that the questionnaire brought up is using a questionnaire. Even in our clinic, we do a screening questionnaire on all patients who are uh, having a full exam, regardless of whether they're going undergoing surgery or anything. We use a DQ5, which is a quick little questionnaire you can give to all of your patients. And what this does is when they start to fill those out, patients, will start to uh, realize, because they initially may think, hey, if I have blurry vision, if I see glare, that's just my eyes are bad, or I need new glasses. When they start to fill out this questionnaire and they see those questions and they see dry eye, it kind of plants a seed in their brain. And when they come to me and then I kind of, uh, and even the pretester uh, does that questionnaire and talks to them about it. Now, when they come and sit in your chair, you have that information and you can be like, hey, I looked at your uh, DQ5 score, you scored eight. Anyone above six is considered to have potential dry eye. Anything about 12 is supposed to be severe dry eye. So you're based on your questionnaire, you have, you may possibly have dry eye. And then you, if they say like, yeah, I get glare and issues, you say, hey, this may be one of the reasons why. So I would do it on every patient, regardless of whether you're sending them out for surgery. But in terms of, especially if they're going out for surgery, I would do it and I would tell them, even if you don't feel anything right now, or even if you just feel, uh, little bit of symptoms right now. Post-op, your dry eye will worsen. So you may have all these things coming uh, to bother you. And especially, you want to make sure we take care of it before because you want, you're going through surgery. It's a one-time process, not something that's as easily reversible. What are your uh, goals? You want to get the best vision, especially patients who are paying thousands of dollars for LASIK and PRK. You tell them, hey, you want the best outcome. You want to make sure you're in the best position to do that. It's like going for marathon running. You want to make sure you're trained for that, you're fully prepared for that. And you tell them that 
uh, and even just as optometrists to realize, studies have shown that people who never had dry eye symptoms before, but after surgery, they start having dry eye symptoms, they'll blame the cataract surgery for those symptoms. They, because they're like, no one told me about dry eye, so it's not dry eye, it's the surgery. And then they'll blame you and the surgeon for doing a bad job. But if you let them know before, at least they're a little bit more approachable in terms of, okay, now I see what you were talking about. So that I would approach it, definitely use a questionnaire on all patients and patients who are undergoing surgery, let them know if you want the best refractive outcome, if you want the best comfort, if you want the best healing, all research has shown that you should test for dry eye. Perfect, thank you. The next question, how likely is an asymptomatic patient who tests positive on a dry eye survey to mm -hmm. pursue dry eye assessment and treatment? Mm, that's a good question. I'm not sure about the whole, if anyone has looked into that, at least looking through our own thing, uh, it's not very high, I'll be honest, just because sometimes patients who are asymptomatic are harder to convince. However, patients who are undergoing LASIK or PRK surgery, in, at least in our clinics, we have noticed that even though they are asymptomatic, I would say maybe about 20% of them still undergo dry eye testing because these people are very motivated to get the best refractive outcome. And when you let them know of this, even if they're completely fine, they want to make sure, okay, just make sure objectively I'm good. Make sure everything is good, especially nowadays, many people, they like having the osmolarity reading. I tell them, they're like, okay, that's a good score. And then they feel much more confident and happy before they go out and spend thousands of dollars. So in normal population, not as much, but in LASIK, PRK population, and even some cataract population, I would say that's a higher prevalence of that. Great, thank you. The next question, do you have any experience with Zydra and do you think it's better than Restasis? So yeah, Zydra is interesting. I tried to look at research studies to see, especially in post-op. Unfortunately, there's not much on Zydra right now, just given there's a newer eye drop. In just my own personal experience, I have had it, it's roughly equal to Restasis in terms of comfort and in terms of healing it, but it does work faster, which is what I like about Zydra. It does work faster compared to Restasis. Restasis, as we know, can take about three months. You either roughly about two to three weeks, it starts to have an effect. But I have found it's actually very variable and sometimes hard to predict. I've had patients uh, who I put on cyclosporin, they didn't adapt to it, had to push them to Zydra. I had patients who were initially on Zydra, did nothing for them, switched them to a stasis and it worked. And I've had patients who didn't react to any of them and they just stopped both. Uh, I don't have any hard data on it, but just personality, personally, I would say they're about equal, but Zydra wins out in terms of having a work faster, but unfortunately, it's a little bit more involved process because we can't prescribe it, so you have to go through an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, someone is asking, uh, please advise on pricing again as a range for reference. Okay, you... so roughly, uh, in terms of dry eye, feel free to email me too. I'll be, we'll be happy to share this with you, and you can even come visit our clinic and we'll have to talk with you. In terms of pricing, I would say, at least when we were starting and discussing, start off with about 165 to 190. I know some places are a lot more, but you also have to consider uh, where you are practicing. Where we practice is a lot of senior population who are on, you know, they're retired, they're on uh, benefits, and uh, they're on like pensions, so they don't have too much money to spend. So you want to make it more affordable for them. So I would say roughly about uh, 165 to 190 range would be the range for full dry eye testing spectrum. Obviously, if you have less uh, instruments, if you only have osmolarity, or let's say, I would say about 45 to 55, $60 for osmolarity testing is good. Great. We have two more questions. I know it's three o'clock, but if people want mm -hmm. to stay on, we'll yeah, do a few yeah. more questions. Um, how does newer, how do newer procedures like SMILE compare with LASIK PRK in terms of post-surgical dry eye disease? So yeah, that's good. I, we didn't touch too much on SMILE in the actual presentation, but SMILE has been shown to be actually much better in terms of lessening dry eye symptoms post-op versus LASIK and PRK. And uh, understanding why that is, is because LASIK and PRK, most of the dry eye is caused by, due to the central nerve fiber layer density loss due to uh, when the surgery is actually done. But in SMILE, the amount of tissue that's taken out is lessened, and the area where that tissue is taken out is lessened as well. So you get less corneal nerve damage. And uh, we didn't present it in the presentation, but there was a study comparing SMILE to LASIK, and what they found was 
at one month mark post-op, in terms of dry eye symptoms, LASIK and SMILE are similar. However, by the six month mark, the patients who had SMILE were doing a lot better. They had lower OSCI score, they had better tear breakup time, and they had a lower osmolarity. And by the six month mark, 80% of the people in the SMILE group did not feel the need to use any eye drops. So 80% of them said, I'm good without eye drops. And by the six month mark in the LASIK group, 57% of them said they didn't need eye drop. So SMILE is also has been shown it uh, increase, uh, the corneal nerve sensation recoveries faster in the SMILE, and there's less nerve density loss in SMILE. So in, just in terms of, strictly in terms of dry eye, SMILE is better. Great, thank you. And we have one last question here. Asians tend to have higher prevalence of dry eye disease in the general population. Does this also extend to them having a higher likelihood of dry eye post-surgery? Uh, yeah, Asians do tend to have higher prevalence of chronic dry eye even before surgery, just in normal, when you look at normal prevalence. But after surgery, this is the case as well. So there were some studies conducted on patients who underwent LASIK, and they looked at an Asian population and compared it to Caucasian eyes, and the difference was really apparent. Um, what they found was Asians already tended to have more dry eye before surgery, but after surgery, the difference became more pronounced. The Asian eyes showed slower recovery to their pre-op levels compared to the Caucasian eyes, and at the six-month mark after surgery, the Asian eyes were pretty much worse in all the different factors measured versus the Caucasian eyes. And we don't fully understand why that is. And some of it may be just due to the eyelid shape. And what they have also noted is just due to the lid laxity, uh, we fully don't understand why, but studies have shown that Asians tend to blink less. And when they blink less, especially after post-surgery, they get less, uh, their tear film is more disruptive and which would cause uh, those higher degrees of dry eye symptoms that's seen. And another thing maybe agents tend to be more myopic, so they require more ablation during surgery. So there's deeper stromal ablation, so you'll get slower recovery of the corneal sensation and corneal nerve density compared to Caucasian eyes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to thank Dr. Bhatia for this insightful presentation. And I'd like to thank IMED Pharma for partnering with OAO for today's webinar.